This video is the second in a series of three about reproductive histology and physiology, and the second of two that focuses on the structural and functional features of the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system consists of a series of organs that function together to produce and nourish viable offspring. The ovaries, uterine tubes, uterus, and vagina comprise this system. While the mammary glands are important for the nourishment of offspring but are not considered reproductive organs per se. In the first video, we discussed the structure and function of the ovary and the ovarian cycle. Today, we'll discuss the rest of the female reproductive organs, the uterine cycle, and hormonal regulation. These organs function together to facilitate fertilization, provide an environment for fertilization, and hold the embryo until birth. We'll start with the uterine tubes, but first, let's quickly review ovulation. Recall that there is a surge of luteinizing hormone that has multiple effects on the follicle. First, the dominant oocyte undergoes the first meiotic division and arrests in metaphase II. At the same time, the granulosa cells produce prostaglandins and hyaluronin that loosen the cells and make the follicular fluid more viscous. These prostaglandins stimulate smooth muscle contractions in the theca externa while the ovarian wall becomes weakened by plasminogen. These events all combine to cause the follicle to rupture and release the ovum along with the corona radiata into the peritoneal cavity. The oocyte is now swept by extensions of the oviduct, termed fimbrae, into the oviduct proper where it can be fertilized. The uterine tubes, or fallopian tubes, or oviduct, consist of a pair of thin muscular tubes that stretch between the ovary and the uterus, although they do not attach directly to the ovary. They function to provide an environment for fertilization of oocytes and to transport the zygote to the uterus. The oviduct is a three-layered tube consisting of an elaborately folded mucosa, a thick muscularis containing interwoven layers of longitudinal and circular smooth muscle, and a very thin serosa. This is visceral peritoneum covered in mesothelium. The tube can be divided into four regions, the infundibulum, which is the most distal funnel-shaped region that opens into the peritoneal cavity. The most distal end has fimbrae, finger-like extensions that function to capture the oocyte, ensuring that most of the time the oocyte is delivered to the uterus. The ampulla is an expanded central region where fertilization normally occurs. Histologically, the ampulla and infundibulum are indistinguishable similar to the body and fundus of the stomach, with the most elaborately folded mucosal extensions that can be seen here in this H&E stained slide. The isthmus is the narrow proximal region near the uterine wall, while the intramural or uterine portion passes through the uterine musculature and opens into the uterus. The mucosa of both the isthmus and intramural portions becomes much less convoluted, while the thickness of the muscularis increases. Each oviduct is lined with simple ciliated columnar epithelium resting on a highly vascular lamina propria. There are two types of cells in this epithelium, the ciliated columnar cells and PEG cells, which are non-ciliated secretory cells that are indicated in this H&E stain section by the blue arrows. Their function is to provide nourishment for the zygote and to provide factors that will enhance sperm activation. Here in this H&E stain section, you can see the two epithelial cell types, as well as an EM image that contrasts the ciliated and PEG cells. This epithelium will undergo cyclical changes during the menstrual cycle. The epithelial cells will hypertrophy, and the cilia will elongate during the follicular or proliferation phase, while they then atrophy and shed cilia in the late secretory phase. In ovulation, the fimbrae will move closer to the ovary, engorge with blood and surround the ovary like a glove, ready to catch the oocyte, and the cilia sweep the oocyte into the oviduct. If fertilization doesn't take place in 24 to 36 hours, the oocyte will degenerate. Meanwhile, the secretions from the PEG cells will lubricate the lumen, providing protection and nutrition. After fertilization, and as the zygote divides, the beating cilia and contractions of the muscularis wall will move the zygote to the uterus for implantation. Ectopic pregnancy can occur if the zygote implants in a location other than the uterus, and the most common site is the ampulla of the uterine tube. The next major reproductive organ we'll discuss is the uterus, which is a pear-shaped organ that functions to support and nourish the growing fetus. The uterus has four regions. 
the upper dome-shaped fundus, the body where implantation usually occurs, the narrow isthmus, and the cylinder-shaped cervix that inserts into the vagina. The uterus is not a normally large organ, about 50 grams, but it will greatly enlarge during pregnancy and then shrink during menopause. The wall of the uterus consists of three layers, the mucosa or endometrium, the thick muscularis or myometrium, and the outer connective tissue layer termed the perimetrium, and this can be either adventitia or serosa depending upon location. We'll start by looking at the myometrium. The myometrium consists of several layers of smooth muscle which will undergo extensive growth during pregnancy and will contract during childbirth or parturition. The blue arrowed line here represents the thickness of the myometrium, which is not all visible in this particular H&E stained section. This layer is the site of the most common uterine tumor, the benign lyomyoma or uterine fibroid. These are smooth muscle tumors and are usually asymptomatic but can cause heavy menstrual bleeding and sometimes impair fertility. These tumors are dependent upon estrogen and progesterone and they grow until menopause when they will shrink due to lack of hormones. This layer contains large arcuate arteries that will give rise to the spiral and straight arteries that will supply the endometrium. Now during each monthly cycle, the ovarian hormones promote the proliferation of the endometrium and prime the uterus to receive an embryo. If pregnancy doesn't occur, most of the endometrium will slough off and regenerate in the following weeks. This process occurs in the body, fundus, and isthmus of the uterus. However, the cervical wall differs from the rest of the uterus as we'll see shortly, and so it changes less dramatically during the cycle. Let's look at the endometrium. The endometrium consists of simple ciliated columnar epithelium that has ciliated and secretory cells resting on a highly cellular lamina propria that contains tubular mucus secreting glands termed the uterine glands. The structure, thickness, and functional state of the endometrium all undergo marked changes during the ovarian cycle. The endometrium has two distinct layers. Marked here in orange, is the functionalis or functional layer that comprises around four-fifths of the endometrium. This is the layer that is shed and regenerated in the first half of the ovarian cycle. In the second half, the glands will change and secrete products that nourish the embryo. Implantation of the placenta will take place in this layer. Now the basal layer or basalis, shown here in blue, is the layer closest to the myometrium. This thin layer contains the bases of the uterine glands, and these are not shed at menstruation, but will proliferate to reconstitute the functional layer. These two layers have very distinct blood supplies. The basal layer, shown in blue, is supplied by straight arteries derived from the arcuate arteries in the myometrium. These are not affected in the ovarian cycle by decreased progesterone levels. On the other hand, the functional layer of the endometrium is supplied by spiral arteries, also derived from the myometrium. In the absence of pregnancy, progesterone levels will decrease, and the smooth muscle of the spiral artery will constrict in response. This will decrease the blood flow and cause the functional layer to become ischemic, die, and then it will slough off as menses. We'll now discuss the ovarian or menstrual cycle. The cycle refers to the changing pattern of hormonal production in the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and ovaries that occurs during reproductive life. It's termed the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis, or HPO axis. These changes in hormones control the resultant changes in the endometrium. The cycle is roughly 28 days and can be divided into three phases that are seen in this cartoon. The top panel shows the state of the ovarian follicles while the bottom panel shows the changes in the endometrium. Hormones that control each phase are also highlighted here. Day one corresponds to the first day of menses, and as is so often the case in histology, the other phases have multiple names that reflect the different aspects of each phase, either the functional state of the endometrium, or the ovarian follicle, or the major hormone involved. Let's go through the three phases. The menstrual or resting phase is from roughly days one through four. During this phase, the menstrual discharge appears, and this consists of the blood from the ruptured spiraled arteries and the sloughed off functional layer. 
After this phase, the endometrium will consist only of the basal layer with the bases of the glands. The proliferative or estrogenic or follicular phase is from days 5 through 14. During this time, the cells in the lamina propria and glands in the basal layer will proliferate in response to estrogen from the ovarian follicles and thus reconstitute the functional layer of the endometrium. This phase ends when ovulation occurs. The secretory or luteal or progestational phase occurs from days 14 through 28. After ovulation, the corpus luteum is secreting progesterone and in response, the uterine glands will secrete glycogen and glycoproteins to nourish the embryo. These glands become coiled and distended and fill with secretory product, which will thicken the functional layer. If fertilization does not occur, the corpus luteum degenerates, the progesterone levels drop, and the cycle will return to the menstrual phase. Now let's look at some H&E stained sections of the endometrial phases. First, during the menstrual phase, we see that the functional layer has been shed and only the basalis or basal layer with the bases of the glands remains. The next image shows the restoring of the functional layer and the cartoon illustrates the changing appearance of the uterine glands. They are now straight and have empty lumens. This phase is estrogen dependent. Finally, we can look at the secretory or luteal phase. Here you can note the coiled appearance of the sacculated glands that are filled with secretory product. The cartoon illustrates the coiled appearance of the glands here. And now we can also appreciate the spiral arteries close to the glands, shown here at low and at higher magnification. This cartoon is provided for review as it nicely illustrates the ovarian cycle you need to pay particular attention to the changing levels of the pituitary and ovarian hormones. You should be able to link these changing levels to the important events in ovarian follicle and oocyte development, as well as to the changes that occur in the uterine endometrium in response to the ovarian hormones. For example, estrogens are the predominant ovarian hormone during the proliferative phase, while progesterone, or the progestational hormone, predominates during the secretory phase, and it's the drop in progesterone levels that will trigger the menstrual cycle. Let's move on and look at the lower cylindrical part of the uterus, the cervix. The cervix is the part of the uterus that bulges into the vagina. The walls of the cervix do not contain large amounts of smooth muscle like the rest of the uterus, but are mostly dense irregular connective tissue. This connective tissue is covered with epithelium, mostly by a simple columnar mucus secreting epithelium similar to most of the uterus. But as the cervix gets closer to the vagina, in the area called the endocervix, this is lined with stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium, just like the vagina. This epithelium depends both upon age and location. The location where the two types of epithelium meet is termed the squamocolumnar junction that can be seen here in this H&E stained section. This cartoon illustrates the age-dependent changes in this junction. At birth, the exposed ectocervix is covered with stratified epithelium, and the endocervix, close to the cervical canal, is covered with columnar epithelium. Hormonal changes during puberty will cause the columnar epithelium to spread and cover the endocervix. However, at the same time, the vaginal environment becomes acidic, and this exposure to the acidic vaginal environment causes the epithelium of the ectocervix to transform into stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. As women age, the stratified epithelium begins to cover more and more of the ectocervix and after menopause can extend into the cervical canal. Recall that this transformation of columnar epithelium to stratified epithelium is an example of metaplasia or the transformation of one differentiated cell type into another differentiated cell type. And this occurs in a region termed the transformation zone. Here's another cartoon that illustrates this transformation, as well as an example of an H&E stain section showing this metaplasia. Not surprisingly, and very similar to the other examples of metaplasia that we've discussed in the esophageal cardio region and the rectal anal junction, 
the cervical squamocolumnar junction is the site at which most cervical cancers originate. Another change that occurs in the cervix with age is the formation of nabothian cysts. These are benign overgrowths of stratified squamous epithelium that often block the openings of glands. Interestingly, these are not linked to cervical cancer. The final reproductive organ is the vagina, the flattened muscular tube that functions to receive the penis during sexual intercourse and to passage the fetus during childbirth. The mucosa of the vagina is a stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium that lacks glands. Now, although the vagina lacks glands, it is kept moist and lubricated by exudate from veins in the mucosa, mucus produced by the cervix, as well as fluid produced by the vestibular glands that line the vaginal opening. In response to estrogen, the epithelial cells of the vagina will synthesize glycogen, and when the epithelial cells desquamate, the benign bacteria in the vagina will convert this glycogen to organic acids. The acids will keep the vagina at a low pH, which helps inhibit the growth of pathogens. Now alkaline components of semen will neutralize the pH of the vagina to make the environment safe for sperm passage. The vaginal epithelium rests on a lamina propria that contains a large amount of elastic fibers and many immune cells, while the muscularis consists of scattered bundles of smooth muscle. The vagina is covered by an adventitial layer that also has abundant elastic fibers, and this helps make the vagina elastic and distensible. We'll end by briefly looking at the mammary glands. As noted previously, these glands are not part of the reproductive system per se, but they do function to provide nourishment after birth. The paired glands are composed of lobes divided by dense irregular connective tissue and adipose tissue. Each lobe contains a single branched gland. These are branched compound tubular alveolar glands, essentially they're modified sweat glands. The secretory portions are the alveoli and the alveolar ducts. Now these glands undergo tremendous changes during pregnancy and lactation. Seen first in these cartoons in h and &E stained section, the glands in a non-pregnant woman appear inactive. They consist mostly of ducts and rudimentary secretory units. These ducts will converge into the main lactiferous duct, which will enlarge and become the lactiferous sinus. During pregnancy, however, increasing levels of estrogen, progesterone, and prolactin will stimulate the mammary epithelial cells to proliferate and to form secretory alveoli and alveolar ducts. The epithelium of the mammary gland is a simple cuboidal secretory epithelium surrounded by myoepithelial cells that control milk release. Milk release itself is triggered by oxytocin from the posterior pituitary in response to sensory signaling from the nipple upon breastfeeding. That's all for the female reproductive system. Be sure to check out the third video in this series on the male reproductive system.